the strike on these uh, is uh, on by the Israelis on the World Central Kitchen aid workers has had tremendous fallout. I would say, especially among American liberals, um, which is interesting for a variety of reasons. But Chef Jose Andres himself speaking out over the weekend and taking a very hard line against the Israelis here, really calling into question their quote-unquote investigation into what happened. Let's take a listen to a bit of what he had to say. We could argue that the first one, let's say, was a mistake. The second, the third. Do you believe World Central Kitchen was targeted? Uh, on purpose. I, uh, my humanity tells me that obviously I don't want to believe that World Central Kitchen was targeted. And, and probably this was not the case. Because offshore they knew our movements, offshore they knew uh, our teams, offshore they were in direct contact um, with the different people that coordinate uh, in these situations. But obviously this seems keeps happening. This breaking of communications keeps happening. You wrote a very emotional tweet this week about, about Zomi, saying, I wish I never founded your organization. You would be alive somewhere today, smiling and making somebody somewhere feel like they were the most beloved person in the world. You said you wish you'd never founded World well, Central Kitchen. You know, um, I will forever have to live with this as well as the families and all the members of World Central Kitchen. I, I, I founded it with one very simple idea. Can we provide food and water quicker than anybody else? Obviously, something like this makes you think. We did what we did because there's a lot of people that are always forgotten. Many civilians, women, children, that the only thing they did was trying to get close by to somewhere that they were giving them flour or bread. This is not anymore about the seven men and women of World Central Kitchen that perish on this unfortunate event. This is happening way for too long. It's been six months of targeting anything that seems moves. This doesn't seem a war against terror. This doesn't seem anymore a war about defending Israel. This really, at this point, seems it's a war against humanity itself. So obviously some really striking comments there made by Chef Jose Andre saying this doesn't seem anymore a war about defending Israel. This really at this point seems it's a war against humanity itself. Remember, early on, I mean, he was a supporter of this war early on. So to hear that from him is quite striking. Um, in, in addition, suggesting they were targeted directly. Uh, calling for an independent investigation, calling into question the results of the Israeli investigation that already occurred. Talking about it, it seems that they are targeting everything that moves, killing women and children whose only crime is seeking out a loaf of bread or a bag of flour. Um, let's go ahead and pull up this next piece, this IDF investigation that occurred and uh, what they claim to have found. So they dismissed two officers over those deadly drone strikes on aid workers. Basically, they're sticking with this, uh, with this story that somebody spotted a supposed uh, militant with a gun, not even a militant, just a person with a gun and that that was enough for a strike on this aid convoy to be authorized. And again, keep in mind, first of all, in a war zone, it is entirely appropriate to have someone with a gun escorting an aid convoy. Second of all, as Jose Andres himself uh, indicated, as you could see in that photo that was just up on the screen, all three of the vehicles had the World Central Kitchen logo on the top. They were coordinating directly with the IDF. They were traveling along a known deconfliction route. They were following protocol to a T. Every communication was made to try to ensure that the Israelis knew, hey, we are leaving our warehouse and we are heading out in these vehicles. And did they, they, they weren't struck once, they weren't struck twice, they were struck three times. And we're supposed to believe that, you know, it was, oh, it was just a mistake. It was just a misunderstanding. Oh, we couldn't see the World Central Kitchen logo in the darkness. So that was uh, what they found. But even, Sagar, if you believe their story, 
it really demonstrates the actual uh, rules of engagement on the ground, which even the theoretical potential presence at one point of someone with a gun was enough to justify the murder of seven aid workers using three different drone strikes. Yeah, I don't want to sound insensitive, but part of what has annoyed me about the turn on this, and we're about to get to this, is that it took the killing of these Western aid workers mm -hmm. to prompt this. This has been self-evident since, what, the very day that they announced, uh, what was it, that they announced that they were doing a complete siege mm -hmm. into the Gaza Strip. Yeah. Like, we have known from day one, this was evident whenever three Israeli hostages came out of a building waving a white flag in Hebrew saying, we are hostages, and they shot them dead because the rules That's of engagement right. were. So it, it wasn't enough when they killed their own people. It wasn't enough whenever they killed people on camera. At this point, if you are living on the internet and you have watched videos of the IDF that's engaged in combat, you have known that this is what the rules of engagement were. Nobody was fired or held to the account for that. The, they themselves yeah, they put post out. That's what I mean. In many instances, and by so the way. It was only when a member of DC royalty was personally affected by this as everybody decided to like pearl clutch around that. I'm not erasing the lives of these aid workers. It's just such a, a self-interested portrait that I, I actually want people at home to take in. Jose Andres is royalty in this town. He owns a bunch of restaurants. You know, his World Central Kitchen stuff is always, it, it, that's like secondary. He is a social pillar of Washington, has been for I mean, at least 15, 20 years. All of the news anchors that we're about to show you who are now, quote, turning on Israel, they're all friends with him. They have all that's dined right. in his restaurants. That's the that's only right. reason that they are changing their tune. So do not be mistaken that this has been uh, some major uh, change of consciousness. As usual in DC, uh, it's only whenever people are personally affected by something. I guess that's human nature. That is the only thing that can genuinely compel anything to change, which in my opinion is frankly outrageous if I you're going to like look at a situation on its merits or not. It's the, the yeah. social, certainly the nature of these yeah. people. I don't think you could say it's human nature when you see you know, the overwhelming bulk of public opinion, when you see the protesters in the street, most of whom don't have a personal stake in this conflict, don't know people who are dying and being starved to death in real time. They were able to see the humanity of Palestinians and the horror of the situation before someone who they personally knew was impacted. But such is the, the narcissism and yes. the bubble and the casual dehumanization that, you know, the elites in Washington swim in that it wasn't even, a, this is important too, to underscore your point, Sagar. It's not like these are the first even aid work, yeah, Western right. aid workers who have been killed. True. Um, there's some 200 plus aid workers who've been killed in this conflict. We've had, you know, doctors who are killed. We've had professors who are killed. We've seen the utter destruction. I mean, this has been in front of our eyes since the beginning. Truly, as you said, since they announced a complete siege, how can you sustain the, the concept that, oh, this is a targeted hunt for Hamas, when by definition, complete siege means you are holding the entire population hostage? So it wasn't when they were targeted attacks on journalists. It wasn't even, you know, that there was an American citizen here. It was that a personal friend of theirs was impacted. That's what it took. Um, but it has apparently created a dramatic change in the way that some liberals are now viewing this conflict. You can almost see it too in the news co oh coverage. God, like the, we have covered so much the anesthetic, like sanitized language that's used when it comes to Palestinians being killed versus Israelis being killed. You can even see in real time some of that language shift in terms of the news coverage. But put this next piece up on the screen. I never expected to see this headline. Nancy Pelosi, who just basically minutes ago was smearing any sort of ceasefire protesters as being paid by Russia or being paid by China, et cetera. She has now joined onto a letter calling to halt U.S. weapons transfers to Israel. Now, there are some caveats with regards to this letter. Um, the language is a little squishy, 
right? Let me read you a little bit. It says, uh, in part, in light of the recent strike against aid workers and the ever worsening humanitarian crisis, we believe it is unjustifiable to approve these weapons transfers. Um, that letter they go on to write in Axios, which was released after the IDF announced the initial findings of its investigation into the attack, includes a call for an independent probe. If this strike, they write, is found to have violated U.S. or international law, we urge you to continue withholding these transfers until those responsible are held accountable. So again, the letter doesn't go so far as to say just cut off the weapons transfers and that's that. They're saying we want an independent investigation. We say we want accountability. If you do those things, then you can continue transferring the weapons. But the fact that Nancy Pelosi signed onto this at all with mm. any sort of language in the direction of potentially, possibly conditioning arms transfers is pretty extraordinary. Maybe it's because uh, just on January 31st, 2024, so three months ago, Nancy Pelosi nominated Jose Andres for the Nobel Peace Prize. And Nancy Pelosi has often lauded the work of Jose Andres, of whom which he has appeared before with several times. It's just, it's all the club. Like, it's all just a social club. If anybody in the social club is effective, then something is changed. Otherwise, it doesn't It doesn't even matter. This is actually a key insight, too, into why Ukraine mania has taken over Washington. Because there's freaking Ukrainians all over this town. And because for some reason, Ukrainians are the only human beings on planet Earth that are supposed to be, like, whatever. If they're being invaded, then it's a, a threat on democracy. Russia is the great enemy. Russiagate also played a good role. But, you know, t- pay very close attention attention as to who is granted personhood status and who is not. That's right. Because it tell, tells That's you right. Lot. And listen, yeah. I'm glad that they're shifting their view, but it is, I saw someone say on, mm. on Twitter, like, it is just too on the nose Yeah. that what it took is right. for their, like, wealthy liberal friend to be directly impacted before they could see what has been obvious to the overwhelming majority of the world since the um, or very early days of this conflict. You referenced this before, but just to give you a sense of how the tone and approach to Israel has changed just like this, like flipped on a dime. Um, We've got a little compilation here for you just to set it up. We've got Morning Joe really, you know, taking a task, an Israeli econ minister. Now, his choice of line of questioning is interesting. We can talk about it after the fact, but the aggressiveness of the tone is kind of what's noteworthy here. You have Jen Psaki, Biden's former press secretary, actually talking about possibly conditioning aid and criticizing directly the Biden administration approach. I haven't personally heard her criticize the Biden administration on anything since she left that post. So that was very noteworthy. And then you have former CIA director Leon Panetta uh, making some extraordinary claims about the way that the Israeli army operates in general. You definitely want to hear that. Take a listen to all of those. You're feeding that wolf and you're telling that wolf to feed the Nazis in Gaza. So explain to me, because I really want to know, why was Benjamin Netanyahu and his government funding, they were allies with Qatar in the funding of Hamas, why? I think it's a mistake, and it was uncovered October 7th. October 7th demonstrated that if you think you could buy quiet, peace, by funding Hamas, it's a huge mistake. And it's clear to me right now. Why did Benjamin Netanyahu, knowing that their charter said that they were to kill Jews and eradicate Israel, why would any leader of Israel work to, to fund that organization to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars? Look, clearly the strategy that the United States is implementing at this point is not working to change the behavior of Prime Minister Netanyahu. It is not working to end the war. So obviously something has to change. Uh, And I think it's pretty clear they're discussing that, I think, in the White House, and I hope in the White House, in this situation room at this point in time. The question is what that will be. You have to be able to verify, to take time, to make sure that the information that you're getting is accurate. Uh, with regards to targets. And I have to tell you that in the past, at least uh, in my experience, the Israelis usually fire and then ask questions. The Israelis usually fire and then ask questions. What did you make of uh, uh, those various well, okay. comments? The last one in particular, I was just telling you what I was playing. Leon Panetta was a man who had the greenlit a huge portion of the Obama drone program. 
I mean, and if, if we were to take, at the worst, the civilian casualties under the Obama drone program was some 90-something percent. At best, it was like maybe 45, 50 percent. Don't exactly want to hear it from Mr. Panetta, um, who did some of that behavior, but I mean, I guess it's one of those where you could take it from his word. At the very least, you could say this, the blob is shifting against them. Panetta, I should remind people, former Secretary of Defense, former CIA director, at one point advocated for literal war with Russia. You, we can roll the tape if anybody wants to go and check it. So for somebody like him to change his tune, I would say it's certainly noteworthy. The Morning Joe piece is just like, what are we doing here, dude? We were talking about this on October 8th. I, no, actually, I think our first show was October 9th. Okay, so October 9th, that was the very first time that you heard it here on the show. It was a legitimate point of view and, and, and conversation about how we got here and what some of the background About were. how BB bolstered Hamas like, to create a divide between right. the West Bank and Gaza and built them up and funded them and even made explicit comments about how if you want to block a two-state solution, right. you need to bolster Hamas. But yeah, that that. This is the conversation right. now. So Weird why is that choice. the conversation yeah. now? What are, exactly are we doing here? Okay, I just want to return to this. It, one of their friends was personally affected by the situation. So now everybody's got to change. It's like Jen Psaki. I can't, I, it, it would be difficult to count the number of times she's probably personally eaten at a Jose Andres establishment. And when you're in the White House, he's there all the time. He was there, you know, this is like a bipartisan thing. Don't get me wrong. Under Trump, he was a celebrity here in Washington too. So for them, Israel's only real crime was hitting a, a, me, a staff member of somebody who is basically royalty here in Washington. But that was enough for people in the media to change. So I don't know. I you just know, keep saying it over and over again. Just to, to comment yeah. on some of the specific comments. Part of what I thought was really noteworthy about Panetta's comments is they weren't confined specifically to this onslaught in mm -hmm. Gaza. He said the Israelis usually fire and then ask questions. So uh, it is extraordinary. It, it's quite noteworthy for a member in good standing of the blob to cast dispersions over Israeli military conduct across not just this war, but many previous conflicts and mowings of the grass previously, and would have been unthinkable up till basically this moment, um, and would have probably you know, gotten you tagged as an anti-Semite or whatever. And the, the line previously was always, oh, this is the most moral army on the planet, et cetera, et cetera. So that was nowhere to me. The Saki thing speaks for itself. The fact that she even feels compelled to critique the administration. You know, it's a little bit of, you know, kid gloves or whatever, but that she says anything against them is noteworthy. And the morning Joe one, because the line of questioning is so strange at this moment, it's so not the point of what people are really concerned about right now when you have um, somewhere around 40,000 Palestinians who have been killed. You have the entire Gaza Strip completely decimated and in rubble. You know, you have obviously the killing of these aid workers. You have this situation that could spiral out of control with regard to this, uh, you know, attack on the Iran consular building. And you're going back to almost attack BB from the right of you were supporting Hamas and you were bolstering Hamas and you were too supportive of Hamas. My read into it is that uh, Joe Scarborough is smart enough to know that the moment has changed, that he can't have this Israeli government person on and just play patty cakes with him the way that he would have, you know, a week ago before this strike. But he doesn't actually really want to criticize what's happening yeah. in Gaza right now. I agree. So this was the line of questioning that he felt like was safe for all of his various constituent audiences, but could sort of like bluster to the Morning Joe audience and, you know, the liberals who watch MSNBC that he was being tough on Israel, but not in a way that actually matters right now. For what it's worth, that's what I read into the um, Morning Joe exchange there. The last one we wanted to, to show you, which... This is very striking. Senator Tim Kaine, who is, you know, the most kind of mainline, run-of-the-mill Democrat, with a few ex exceptions. He's kind of mm -hmm. good on, like, um, on like the surveillance, mass surveillance. And he has a few things yes. where he can, but typically he's just, like, the most run-of-the-mill yes. mainstream Democrat. He made a suggestion that our troops that are being sent to build this pier, which are coming from Virginia, so he has you know, direct stake as their representative in, in the Senate, that not only could they be in danger from Hamas and other uh, militants, they could be in danger from the IDF themselves. Let's take a listen to that. Even this U.S. military operation, these are, um, these are some troops that are deployed out of Virginia, Fort Eustis in Virginia, mm -hmm. in charge of this Marine Pier operation. We knew when we announced that they, they might be in harm's way from Hamas. But 
you know, after the events of this week, anybody doing humanitarian aid is going to wonder if they're in harm's way from the IDF. So suggesting that U.S. troops could be in harm's way from the IDF, what did you make of that, Zagar? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think it's very important. And what I think is we get what people look, this has opened up a conversation. We are allowed to talk now about conduct as it will affect foreigners who are in Gaza. This is basically how the expansion of the Overton window gets. Save the Overton window for the Candace Owens discussion. <laughs> uh, the point is, is that as this is changing and things are going to a point where they're trying to send a signal, basically they're trying to salvage their ability to be pro-Israel in the future by putting down some of these noteworthy comments and here with immense pressure, I think, to try and back up Biden and generally the other Western countries, including the European Union, which we often don't talk about, but they're very, very different on this issue than even here. Even the pro-Israel nations are much more willing to criticize, to pressure, to try and recognize Palestinian statehood. I think things are very obviously going in a certain direction and they are uh, kind of leading from behind in the old Obama mm -hmm. uh, speak. But I, I mean, I think it is true. I think it's What's really crazy to me to watch here with Biden is the vacillation, his, uh, you know, being his hand, quote unquote, being forced only when a member of Washington royalty is personally affected, never actually leading with principle or with guidance or it's just the absence of leadership in this with both with his own personal ideology, his stubbornness, and really the C team of people he has with him is just so self-evident in the entire handling of this discussion. Yeah. And I don't want to make too much of this shift because I think it's entirely possible that Israel does just enough of, you know, letting a little more aid mm -hmm. trucks in, opening another crossing, doing enough to placate the Biden administration. And to go back to those original Biden comments that we played you, to me, that's what his comments are indicative of. He says, oh, I asked them to do what they're doing, indicating, oh, he's satisfied with the response. It's enough for him. Mm -hmm. And I think it is very possible, if not likely, that we still don't really see a change in U.S. policy, that the Biden administration goes back to basically lockstep support and points to these few little, you know, additional crumbs that were thrown out here from Israel as some big win, big humanitarian win, and we go back to business as usual. I think that's probably the most likely outcome here. So again, I don't want to make too much of it, but you know, between not just this strike on Jose Andres um, humanitarian aid workers, but also the political writing is just so clear on the wall now. There's another piece in, uh, I believe, Politico about how it's sunken to some of the the president's campaign team that the image that. P voters previously had of him as this like, yeah, I may not agree with everything, but he seems like a nice guy. Dead and gone. Right. Done. Done. And they can see the, the battleground polling. They can see the problem they have in Michigan. They can see the problem they have with young voters. More on that in a later block as well. And so between those two things, they feel the need to aggressively tone shift and at least extract something they can point to from the Israelis to say, see, we care and we made them change. We did that. We forced their hand. And that's how, you know, that's the way that we conduct themselves and that ourselves. And that's why we're way better than Trump too, by the way, on this issue. But am I incredibly hopeful that we're going to see an entire like sea change in terms of U.S. policy? Not particularly. Yeah, I think you're right. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.